Captain Dylan Hubbard, let's everybody give him a big welcome. Well, uh, appreciate everybody uh, for having me out tonight. Uh, th can everybody hear me back there? I'm using the microphone for Vance, he asked specifically. Can you hear me? All right. So, uh, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Captain Dillon. This is actually my first in-person seminar since February 2020. So, appreciate you guys inviting me out here, and uh, it's good to be talking in person, finally. And, uh, yeah, amen to that. Double, double round of applause for that. Uh, so, I'm from Hubbard's Marina, as uh, hopefully some of you know. Uh, Hubbard's Marina, we operate multiple uh, multi-passenger charter boats and party boats, and we do a little bit of everything near shore, offshore, uh, mostly focused near shore and offshore, but we also work with people like uh, Captain Mike Anderson and others to do inshore fishing too. So tonight, I would like to do more of a fishing conversation with you guys. Uh, I really don't enjoy standing up here and talking at you. I like talking with you. So hopefully you guys have some questions for me and we can have more of a back and forth and answering your questions and talking about what you guys wanna hear. Uh, so I'll kick it off with talking about what, what's going on now and what's coming up and what we're expecting. And then from there, hopefully you guys have some questions for me so that way I can talk about what you guys want to hear and what you gals want to hear instead of just me up here droning on, all right? So as far as what's going on now, uh, as the gentleman back there mentioned, we still have red tide around. Red tide never went away. It just got out of the news. So red tide is still in the area, it's still patchy. Uh, right now, the forecasts as of Sunday looked really positive. Uh, it's not in the bay anymore, which is good because when it's in our estuaries, it's very difficult to get it out and it kills a lot of our kind of year one and year zero and year two fish uh, as far as our offshore fish because gag grouper, mangrove snapper, lane snapper, a variety of species use Tampa Bay as an estuary. So. Uh, when we have red tide in there, it's hard to get out and it kills a lot of those future species. So it's good that Tampa Bay is clear, but our beaches definitely still have it around. And as, as you mentioned, I mean, we've seen it out as far as 14 to 16 miles in areas. So you really, when you're heading out there inshore, near shore, you really want to kind of watch for that water quality and look for that cleaner water. It's pretty apparent when it's up on the surface, that dirtier water, obviously not a good area to fish. Uh, and you wanna try to avoid it as best you can. And we've been having problems with live bait. Uh, as you mentioned, we, we just can't catch pinfish. Uh, in a lot of cases, our bait guy uh, literally had to take a month off and start doing landscaping work because he can't catch the pinfish. So it's very frustrating and uh, a lot of people have kind of forgotten about water quality and it's always comical to me when we have a big red tide kill, everybody's up in arms screaming about, we need clean water and, and, and arguing about water quality issues. And then all of a sudden, as soon as that big fish kill disappears, it gets out of the news and people just forget about it. It's still going on and there's definitely a lot of red tide along our coastline right now, but it's not affecting our offshore and nearshore fisheries. So that's good news in my respect, at least, when I'm out there fishing. For most of you guys, uh, who or most anglers, I should say, who fish Tampa Bay and inshore areas and around those grass flats, it's clear in most areas there too. So still plenty of great fish. We're catching a lot inshore, nearshore, and offshore. You just have to watch that red tide area. And if you find, if you go out there and the water's coffee colored, you gotta keep going. You gotta keep going past it. Uh, so definitely the red tide is a big topic right now. Also, uh, we had kingfish show up about two and a half weeks ago. We caught our first kingfish, which was great to see, uh, which was early. Uh, we've definitely had kind of a mild start to our winter time right now. I mean, it's, 
At this point, it's uh, October 13th, and we really haven't had a hardened down front yet. We've had a couple cold fronts come through, but they really haven't increased winds. Uh, and in our beautiful state of Florida, we don't get cold unless we have that hardened down north wind, which increased sea heights and brings us that cooler temperature. So we've had a couple fronts, but they haven't been windy, they haven't been rough, and we haven't gotten cold. So, in order to see those kingfish, we got to get water temperatures anywhere from around 72 to about 78 degrees. Really, right about 73 to about 76 is prime time for that spring and fall kingfish run. So, for us to see those kingfish two and a half weeks ago was exciting uh, because we were hoping that fall run was going to start early and hang around a while. Uh, but unfortunately, we had that fall run kind of start and then it hit a wall of red tide and those fish just bounced offshore. So we're still catching kingfish. We still see a lot of mackerel, but they're pushed out right now. And as those near shore red tide blooms dissipate, hopefully those kingfish and mackerel will come back to the beaches because we saw that this year in our spring run. We didn't really have an on the beach kingfish and mackerel season this spring. And that was because of that red tide that was bubbling. Uh, so hoping, praying, keeping our fingers crossed that this will dissipate and uh, we'll see those fish come in to the beach before they leave the area. Uh, stone crab season is opening up. October 15th, uh, stone crab season opens up. What happens when the stone crab traps go out? Why does that matter if we're here at a fishing seminar? What, Ray, it wasn't a question, it was hypothetical. <laughs> Yes, so that is uh, what I was alluding to. Thanks for taking it away. Uh, no. <laughs> no, Ray Markham is definitely uh, hip to what I was talking about. Those kingfish or those stone crab traps might as well be chum blocks. So the stone crabbers only put their stone crab traps on hard bottom. So there might as well be buoys to you guys when you go out there in boats to hard bottom areas that are gonna hold bait and the stone crabbers left you a nice trap down there filled with bait to attract more bait fish. So you have this fish attracting device that's hopefully catching crabs, but it's also attracting a lot of bait. So it's not only gonna attract those triple tail like Ray Markham said, uh, but it's also gonna attract mackerel. And then with mackerel, kingfish show up. So trolling those crab trap lines this time of year is great for kingfish, mackerel. And if you spot a triple tail, continue past. Don't try to take your boat out of gear and throw it reverse because that triple tail is gonna disappear on you. Continue past it, get ready, rig your rod, bait up with shrimp or use an artificial uh, shrimp lure and then circle back around, take it out of gear and coast. So that way you can approach that fish very stealthy because triple tail are great eating, but they're also very skittish. So you really gotta approach that fish carefully and go give it a good natural presentation. What we like doing and what I would recommend if you're not super confident throwing a free lined live shrimp. What someone taught me uh, who fishes out of South Carolina primarily for triple tail, because up there it's kind of like the Mecca of triple tail fishing, is he uses one of those popping corks and he'll throw a popping cork in line there and then put about a, a anywhere from an 18 to 24 inch liter behind the popping cork. And that gives him specifically just weight. So he'll overcast or tell his clients to overcast the buoy. Because how easy is it to hit a spot as big as this yellow bag? It's more difficult. But if you just wing that thing as far out as you can, it's very easy to kind of maneuver or manipulate your rod tip and retrieve that bait to that strike zone as big as this bag. Hard to cast into it, but if you can't cast super accurately, you can cast past it and retrieve it into that strike zone. Because that's the big thing, is you gotta be in that strike zone for that triple tail to take your bait. Also, you don't see the triple tail all the time. If you're fishing those markers of Tampa Bay, a lot of times you won't even see the triple tail. They'll be subsurface and you just gotta use a super light weight and let that live shrimp kind of sink down one of those marker 
lines and you'll either catch a nice triple tail or a big sheep's head this time of year. So definitely some good inshore fishing on those stone crab traps and hopefully the mackerel and kingfish will come back. We're seeing a lot of lane snapper near shore. Lane snapper fishing's going well. Remember they don't close until October 17th. And then hopefully they're gonna reopen for us around mid-November or as early as early December. So lane snapper fishing's going well. We're catching nice mangrove snapper. The mangrove snapper bite is just going incredibly well. Near shore and offshore this time of year. Inshore too, we're seeing a lot of those mangrove snapper, but once they start hitting that like 10 inch range, they're uh, a majority of those mangrove snapper are sexually mature. So around 10 inches is when the mangrove snapper, about 50% of them will travel near shore at 12 inches. It's like 70% are sexually mature. So once they reach that age is when they travel near shore and move out of the estuary. So about year one, year two, year three fish, this time of year in the fall when the water starts chilling out, those mangrove snapper leave the bay and move near shore. So you get a big push of those mangrove snapper in that near shore water around 40, 50, 60 foot of water upwards of about 100, 110 foot. And then once they get bigger, they'll push out there into that deeper water. So definitely a good time of year for those mangrove snapper. Also, we see the hogfish bite pick up this time of year considerably as that water temperature drops, hogfish come back in. So hogfish will spawn a lot of times uh, in uh, sandier areas off those hard bottom areas in random patches and they spawn in groups. So you'll have one male and a, uh, a handful of females and they'll be out in the sandy patches where it's very difficult to target them. But this time of year, as those cold fronts start coming through, when the water gets rough and windy and nasty, just like you and I, if a bad storm's coming through, you don't want to be standing out in the middle of the field or in the middle of Tampa Bay. If a bad storm's coming through, you immediately seek safe harbor. It's the same thing with these fish. So when these cold fronts start rolling through, especially those hardened down fronts where water temperatures drop quickly, air temperatures drop quickly, barometer drops quickly, those fish will go to those ledges and those hard bottom areas to seek structure and to seek safety from those storms. So near shore around 30, 40 foot of water, upwards of about 90 foot of water becomes very fertile for those uh, hogfish as the water temperatures start to drop. We've already seen that hogfish bite start to pick up and it's only gonna get better and better as that uh, water temperature continues, especially our first big front. It'll really bring those hogfish back centrally located to those hard bottom areas. Smaller ledges is key, and that's the trick, is a lot of people can find a three, four, five foot ledge. Pretty hard to miss, but that little one, two foot ledge, you gotta be going slow. And a lot of people don't go slow when they're out there near shore and offshore in those center consoles. There's not many secrets left. And the secrets that are left are those little one, two, three foot ledges that produce hogfish. So slow it down, folks. That's the trick offshore for sure. Now, uh, that's kind of what's going on now. We've got pinkfish and mackerel showing up, hogfish bite picking up. We got gag grouper gonna be coming in shore soon uh, to fatten up for their spawn in the spring. And um, mangrove snapper bites going well. And uh, we still got some wahoo around, blackfin tuna are picking up. So that's what's going on now. Do you guys have any questions? Captain Ray Markham. It's not really a question, but- Another comment? Yeah, yeah, in the bay. Okay. Yes, yeah, the seasonal closure on flounder. So five flounder to 14 inches minimum, they close October 15th. When do they reopen? 
first of December. So about a month and a half closure, and that's a spawning season closure the FWC enacted, I believe, at the beginning of this year. And they also pushed those state regulations into federal waters since the federal management body, the Gulf Council, didn't have federal regulations in place. The state of Florida's FWC has the ability to push those state regulations into federal waters when there's not federal management in place. So that does apply even offshore. And the biggest thing, as far as fishing regulations are concerned, you guys really, really highly recommend you download the Fish Rules app. The Fish Rules app, it works even when you're offshore, especially if you use it a lot, you access it a lot, it stays refreshed, and it uses the GPS location of your phone. So if you're standing in an area, it'll actually tell you the regulations based on where you're standing. So super helpful when you're out there fishing near shore, offshore, or even on land, it'll tell you what the regulations are based on where you're standing, where your phone is. So definitely recommend the Fish Rules app. That way it makes it a lot easier. You don't have to know all the regulations and intricacies. Even myself, I find myself uh, looking at that app occasionally and trying to uh, relate what I might have forgotten or just double check because things do change. And the FWC and the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council both have partnerships and contracts in place with the Fish Rules app. So when federal management changes, they actually are the ones who log in and change that stuff on the Fish Rules app. So it's almost uh, real time as far as updating the rules in the app. So highly recommend the Fish Rules app. If you haven't found it before, know about it, definitely check that one out. Any other questions? Yes, sir. What are they, what are they gonna do to us with the red snapper right now? Uh, so Red Snapper is, uh, I don't think we have enough time to discuss it, sir. Uh, so Red Snapper is one of those things that uh, is very, very difficult uh, to kind of wade through just because of the different layers of management structures that are in place for Red Snapper. Long story short, Red Snapper is, uh, in my opinion, the one, or uh, let me carefully word this, Red Snapper is a man fisheries management success story. When I was a kid, when I was six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, I didn't know what a Red Snapper was because we just didn't see them, we didn't catch them. When I was 15 years old, we started catching a, a lot of them. Then all of a sudden, they closed the fishery. And then we started catching more and more and more and more and more to the point where you can almost not get away from them and now they're considered to be rebuilt. Now they're not considered overfished and undergoing overfishing at this time. And the red snapper fishery is deemed healthy and they're slowly increasing catch limits and catch levels for these red snapper. Now red snapper management is extremely, extremely convoluted and murky because for red snapper and red snapper only, there's three sectors. And then for Red Snapper and Red Snapper only, the private recreational sector is delegated state management across five Gulf states. So <laughs> it gets very considerably uh, difficult to kind of discern Red Snapper management for that reason. Is there is a sector separation in place between federal for hire and private recreational for hire. For most fisheries, like lane snapper, trigger fish, there's a handful of others that I can't name with certainty, but I know lane snapper, for example, there is no sector allocations, which means there's one quota, and that quota is shared by the two sectors. There's only two sectors according to MSA, or Magnuson-Stevens Act, and that's commercial and recreational. And so for lane snapper, there's only one quota and it's shared by commercial and rec. For red snapper, there's three quotas and it's shared by commercial, recreational, and then subsector of recreational is private rec and federal for hire. And then the private rec quota is then split up five ways across the five Gulf states. And you know what? On that note, 
before we move on from that is the state of Florida's FWC has some of the best representation at the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council because when they enacted state management of red snapper, the overall kind of understanding pre-Great Red Snapper count was that Florida and the Eastern Gulf of Mexico had the majority of landings, but almost no red snapper. That was, if you talk to anybody at a council meeting, oh, you guys catch them all, but there's no red snapper over there. We got them all over here in the Western Gulf. If you talk to someone in Texas, we've got all the biomass, we need more quota. Florida came in there, the woman who represents the state of Florida's FWC at the council is now uh, the vice chair of the council. Her name is Martha Gaez, and she came in there with state management of private recreational red snappers. She got 40, I want to say it's like 44% of the overall golf quota, five golf states, she got 44% of it for the state of Florida. So we represent almost 60% of the landings of Red Snapper across our sectors combined. And she got 44% of the quota for the state of Florida, which is bad to the bone because some other states are not really faring that well as far as percentage cuts. So long story short, uh, the state of Florida has about 1.6 million pounds as an allowable catch limit for private recreational red snapper, and that's delegated to state management. So the feds still are in control to make sure that the fishery isn't overfished, but they delegate management of season size limits, bag limits to the states. So that's how it's worked. And the state of Florida's FWC is thus in control of red snapper regulations, not only for state waters, but also federal waters. In the last three years, they've been announcing these extensions to the seasons. And Governor DeSantis, the FWC, they've been working in conjunction to make those announcements on these extended seasons. However, this year they haven't made that announcement yet. Typically that announcement would follow their October commission meeting. So to me, that they haven't made the announcement yet is either they're still working on the numbers or it may or may not happen, or they're waiting until the very bitter end to make the announcement. I don't know, but I know this year is different. The last three years, they've been making those private recreational uh, red snapper season extensions because the June season for private recreational red snappers started late. And the overall fisheries management belief is that earlier in June that red snapper season starts, typically the higher the landings. Because early June, people are getting out of school, weather is good, there's a lot of people able to go fishing. So the earlier in June the season starts, the shorter the season because the higher the landings because the more people that are on the water. That's the overall management belief. And a lot of people had a lot of consternation about federal for hire opening June 1st and private recreational season was opening like June 11, June 12, the last three years. So this year, FWC Commission voted to move the private recreational season opening date earlier in June. And prior to the federal for hire season being announced as extended i talked to someone at the fwc and i asked them i was like hey why haven't you made the announcement yet when is it coming when is the private recreational season going to be extended i assumed it would be but in talking to them they said that a majority of the quota was landed in june so they're kind of waiting on that last wave of data before they make or don't make a decision on whether to extend the season so Long story short, the decision's in limbo right now. It may or may not happen. Where do they get these numbers from? I thought we were going to talk about fishing. I showed up here. I wanted to talk about catching fish. And you're going to ask me about how MREP works? Son of a sailor. So, uh, where do they get the numbers from? That's a great question. And uh, I am by no means an expert, but I am very um interested in and invested a lot of time in researching and getting involved and educated on fisheries management fisheries science so it's definitely a passion of mine and kind of a way that i view that i'm able to kind of help the region help the area and help fishermen uh across the board whether it's my customers or guys and gals like yourself so to answer your question 
from a fellow fisherman's perspective, by no means an expert, where do they get the numbers? Uh, again, like the earlier question, that really is a six hour conversation over two bottles of Jameson. But uh, a very abbreviated, uh, yeah, a very abbreviated answer is they use what's called MRIP. MRIP. It's the Marine uh, Recreational Intercept Program. So it's basically how they do it is they use a data, a data survey. So let me back up a little bit, ma'am. Ma'am. I'm gonna need another name to explain this. So, uh, so, so basically, let me back up a little bit. So there's, again, there's two sectors. There's commercial and then there's recreational. So the commercial guys, I wanna, I wanna lay some groundwork here. I am federal for hire, but I fancy myself a private recreational angler but getting involved in fisheries management and sharing docks with commercial fishermen. I consider myself a, a cross section of all three. And some people would look at my business and say, you make money off the fishermen, you're, or off the fishery, you're a commercial fisherman. Well, I'm not. According to MSA, I'm a recreational fisherman. So I don't care if you fish off a dock, you fish off a seawall, you fish off a jetty, you fish off your boat, your friend's boat, or my boat. We're all recreational fishermen. We're all out there for the opportunity to catch a fish. So the opportunity to catch a fish makes us recreational fishermen. If you're going out there and your end goal is to fill that fish box and come back and sell that fish, that's a commercial fisherman, in my personal opinion. But that's my personal opinion. So uh, commercial fishermen get a lot of flack is what I'm setting this up for. A lot of people that I talk to who haven't maybe attended meetings or really gotten up on the subject, they're well, commercial fishermen, I mean, they're out there killing everything. They have all year to catch these fish. Dude, commercial fishermen are the most over-regulated industry in my opinion. I mean, a commercial fisherman, before they leave the dock, must hail out. Then once they're out there fishing, uh, anywhere from two to 10% of trips must have an observer on the boat, which you have to feed and, and, and clothe and bathe and all that stuff. You gotta take care of them, make sure they didn't die while you're offshore. So you gotta take care of your observer. And then once you come back in, you have to make a three hour landing notification. So before you hit the dock, you have to tell the feds where, what dock you're going to and you have to give them three hours to get there. And that information goes to the states, to everybody. So they have three hours to decide whether or not they want to show up and inspect your vessel. Then you cannot hit the dock until that three hours is up. Once you hit the dock, then every single fish, every single fish that comes off that commercial boat is measured, weighed, and accounted for. And then it has to go to a fish house and that fish house has to have a fishery dealer's license and they re-measure, weigh, and account for each fish. So literally each ounce of slime that comes off a commercial boat is accounted for. So it's a very heavily regulated sector and they have to have vessel monitoring systems. So every vessel has to have a permanently affixed GPS monitoring system. At any time, at any time of the day, at 24-7, 365, the feds know where that boat is and what speed it's going, what it's heading is, all that good stuff. So, very, very heavily regulated. That's how the commercial sector works. Federal for hire sector, our party boats have been mandatorily reporting since 1986 through what's called the Southeast Regional Headboat Survey. If I go and run a party boat trip as of December of last year, when I come back inshore, I have to fill out a log and then I have to submit it electronically by the end of the week to the feds, telling them how many people I had, where I fished, what I caught, what I caught and kept, what I caught and released, and more. And that was mandatory since 1986. Charter boats and private recreational anglers, there was no sort of data collection program in place. So the charter for hire sector not myself at first, 
but a group of Charter for Hire anglers pushed for what's called ELBs. It became known as the Sea Fire Program. That was uh, that was instituted in January January 5th of this year. The Sea Fire Program is the Southeast Region for Hire. In I forget. Uh, <laughs> it stands for something. But basically what it does is now, as of January 5th, every charter boat and party boat with a federal permit in the Gulf of Mexico has to hail out prior to leaving the dock in the morning, telling uh, the feds what, uh, where we're going, uh, where we plan to fish, how many people we have, who's the captain, what's the name of the boat, what dock we're leaving from, what dock we're coming back, when we leave, when we come back, and our estimated trip end. Then prior to offloading fish, we have to submit a report to say how much our trip costs, how much we charged for it, how much fuel we burned, how much the fuel costs, what we caught and kept, what we caught and released, and more. And this is also in conjunction December 13th, we must have vessel monitoring systems per, uh, permanently affixed to our vessels, just like the commercial sector. There's 800, and, as of two weeks ago, there's 827 commercial boats in the Gulf of Mexico. 827. Federal four hire charter boats and party boats, there's 1,289. That's public information, it's a FOIA request, you can Google it right now while I'm talking and double check those numbers. 827 commercial boats, 1,289 federal four hire charter boats and party boats. So a little more than about 1,300 charter boats, party boats, and commercial vessels. Four weeks ago, I emailed, called, and sent text messages to Gulf Council staff, leadership, Gulf Council members, NOAA Fisheries, NOAA Fisheries staff, NOAA Office of Science and Technology, Gulf States Marine Fisheries Committee, the Southeast, the Southeast Fisheries Science Center, I mean, multiple agencies. I sent probably anywhere from 100 to 150 emails asking, all I asked, how many private recreational boats are registered to prosecute the federal fishery in the EEZ? So nine miles from shore, how many private boats have the ability to go out there and prosecute the fishery? Four weeks ago. Still haven't gotten a fucking answer. Still have not got an answer on that. And so to me, the biggest issue that faces our recreational specifically private recreational fishery because the federal for hire fishery is changing it through the sea fire program is the basic tenets of fishery science which is important guys you, you want to know how the fishery is doing right the basic tenets of fishery science is how many people fished how many hours did it take them to catch x amount of fish what fish did they catch and keep what fish did they catch and release and then there's another one, which I'll think of in a second. But those are the important ones. It's the universe of anglers. How many anglers went out there and fished? And then the hours it took to, caught, to catch X amount of fish is important. That's called CPUE, or catch per unit effort. Because you might be sitting there thinking, well, I'm a better fisherman than this asshole right here. <laughs> you know, a lot of people fish differently. So just because you go out and fish doesn't mean that when he goes out and fishes, he catches fish faster. Or just because you go out and fish in your 25 foot boat doesn't mean that them going out and fishing in their 45 foot freemen are gonna get further catch bigger fish. So CPUE is super important, or catch per unit of effort. So for every hour fish, how many fish do you catch? They don't know. So to answer your question very simply is, they use a data survey and they use what's called data imputation. So someone will come down to the boat ramp with a clipboard and they'll randomly intercept fishermen. So let's say this side of the room over there, there's two, four, six, eight, ten of you guys. They will come down to the ramp and they might see you heard coming in on your boat and they talk to you, hey, what'd you catch? What'd you keep? You might be drunk and be like, hey, I don't want to talk to you. And they might not be able to talk to you. They might, <laughs> they might have to talk to someone else, but basically they'll intercept a handful of people at a, a specific time frame. 
and they'll gauge that information and then imputate it or stratify it or exponentially grow it to put it across that region. So that's why we have these data spikes and these data crevices, because if Herb goes out there in his 42 foot Freeman and screws up the fish and comes in with full limits and they happen to catch him at the dock, that's going to make a major data spike, a major data outlier, because his information is then going to be spread across that region, which his 42 foot Freeman doesn't fish like this 26 foot uh, intrepid or contender that just went out, you know? So that's the major issue with one side of the data survey. What they also do now is called the fishing effort survey. So they send, send out these mailers. Now, before you laugh, they used to do what's called MRIP CHTS, which was the Coastal Household Telephone Survey. So they used to open up the phone book and they pull numbers out and they call and be like, hey, yeah, well, they call home phones. Hey, yeah, did you go fishing the last year? What did you catch? What did you have? And it's like, you answer up, you're eating dinner. It's like, no, they click. So the Coastal Household Telephone Survey had very low uh, response rate and the response rate was poor and the uh, quality of the conversation was poor. They did that coastal household telephone survey up until like four years ago. I mean, how many of you guys had a home phone four years ago? Not many of us. I haven't had a home phone since I was like 14. Uh, so it's, it, it was embarrassing. So they just recently switched to what's called MREP FES which is an improvement of private recreational data survey collection because they send out a mailer, hard copy snail mail. Hard to believe that's an improvement, but it is because think about it like this. You're at home and you get a random phone call on your home phone if you have one. A lot of times you don't answer it. If you do answer it, you're in a rush, you're doing something. It's like, yeah, screw you. I'll just answer it as quick as I can to get you off the phone. You get a mailer. And a lot of times they'll include like a Bass Pro Shops gift card or they'll include some money or some other incentive to fill it out. So people will often fill it out. Plus with the mailer, you have time to throw it on your desk. Yeah, I'll get to that tomorrow. Next week you're paying bills, you see it on your desk. Yeah, I'll fill this out. And then mail it back in, it's free to mail back in. Easy to do. The response rate went from like nil, now it's almost three to four times higher. Great. We got better data. We've got more data to work with. We've got more response rate. Guess what happened? That's what yeah. 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 Too much, too much fish why did red why, why did red grouper close? Yeah. MREP FES. <laughs> so so fisheries have got better response. The data collection program was like, whoa shit. They've been catching how many fish? So the problem is, is now they're getting more response. So the, the, the fisheries prosecution is much higher than anticipated. And how fisheries management works, or fisheries science works again, is how many people fish, what did they catch, what did they catch and keep, what did they catch and release, and how fast did they catch it? So when all of a sudden they found out that you're catching this amount, when they thought that you were catching this amount, fisheries all of a sudden it threw a huge wrench into management because they have to now backdate that data historically. So if you are now catching four times the amount of fish they thought you were catching, that means the fishery is healthier, right? Because you've been catching four times as much as they thought, so the fishery must be healthy. So then they have to backdate that and increase quotas. So what happened with red grouper Super frustrating. I think I need another drink. Uh, so, so what happened with Red Grouper is they came up with this program or this amendment called Amendment 53, and it floated around the council for two and a half years. Because the major problem is Red Grouper, Gag Grouper, no one else catches them except for Florida. Florida is the mecca of the offshore fishery. Everywhere else sucks. And, I'm just kidding, I'm doing that for the video. So when I post it to the internet later, everybody will love it. So uh, uh, you don't catch red grouper in Louisiana or Texas. You catch red grouper in Florida. Gag grouper, not really a Texas or Louisiana thing as much. 
a lot of fisheries are centrally located to Florida. So red grouper was not a Gulf wide issue. So the Gulf Council didn't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole because FES data, MREP FES data causes huge issues for any fishery with sector allocations. Lane snapper. We just had a lane snapper closure. Super frustrating. If you saw my video on that, I went for five and a half minutes on a huge diatribe about how badly the ball was dropped on lane snapper. So lane snapper is a good example of how FES helps because in a fishery without sector allocations, remember I talked about the two sectors, commercial, recreational, without sector allocations, there's no argument. MREP FES shows we've been catching so many more lane snapper. The quota for lane snapper went from around 300 some thousand, I think it was right around the ACL was right around 300,000 pounds. It went to 1.2 million pounds. Granted the data allocation changed. So it went from MREP CHTS to MREP FES data currency. So the currency changed. So it's a little misleading, but the, the allocation jumped almost four times because the fishery has is shown to be that much more healthy. Plus, based on fisheries, uh, a lot of other stuff too. I don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole, but that is a good example of how MREP FES helps when there isn't sector allocations. With red grouper, there's a very strong sector allocation. It's a very heavily commercially fished fishery. Over 76% of the red grouper caught in the Gulf of Mexico come through John's Pass because Madeira Beach, Reddington Shores, Indian Rocks, they are home to a majority of the red grouper fleet in the entire Gulf of Mexico. So red grouper was a big issue. Because of that sector allocation, when MREP FES was injected, it was about 70-20. I'm using round numbers. It was about 70, 20. Commercial fishermen had about 70% of the allocation. Rex had about 20. Now with MREF FES injected, now it's 60, 40. They shifted almost 20% of the commercial allocation of recreational fishermen. They took a million pounds of the commercial fishermen's quota and moved it recreationally. That's what the council did two meetings ago. The council voted on it, voted on it, finalized it, approved it, but NOAA Fisheries then is submitted that finalized vote and then has to implement the rule. The rule hasn't been implemented. So Red Grouper is closed with someone somewhere at NOAA Fisheries sitting with a piece of paper on the deck that on their desk that says, hey, move a million pounds from commercial to recreational but it's not in rulemaking yet. It's not in final, it's not on the books. We're screwed. So commercial or recreational red grouper closed. Commercial fishermen are still out there catching them if they can find quota, which you can't find quota for it because they're all hoarding it because in the commercial industry, you're supplying fish to restaurants. It doesn't really work too well if your season closes fast. But as a restaurant owner, if I can tell you, hey, I'll have fish for you, just not as much this week, but I'll have more for you next month. That's better, right? instead of just cutting off your supply. So that's what the commercial fishermen IFQ system is doing. They're holding that quota, so that way they can squeak out their quota each month, and at least you have some red grouper on the menu. You can charge more for it at that point, right? Limited yeah. supply, dog. <laughs> so that's what's happening with red grouper, and that's why commercial red grouper is open, recreational red grouper is closed. And so that's what kind of frustrates me when people are like, why can commercial fishermen catch red grouper and I can't? You just stole a million pounds, 20% of their allocation. Now, I know that doesn't really make you feel that good this year, but next year, the red grouper fishery probably will not close for recreational fishermen. And if it does, it would be super late in the year because not only did that happen, but they're working right now on a catch level increase for red grouper because the fishery has rebounded. The fishery is healthier, we're catching more red grouper more quickly, and they're larger. So MREP FES is good in some respects, bad in some respects, and a very short, that was the short answer, by the way, to your question. Uh, that was the short answer. I'm afraid to ask you though. Don't ask about MREP, we'll be all right. How, how do the uh, commercial grouper fishermen fish with them? Long line? So there is 827 commercial boats in the Gulf of Mexico. 
and those uh, numbers include longline, bandit, and rod and reel fishermen. Bandit is basically like a, an electric reel, a really big electric reel, and they have multiple hooks vertically. I don't know the exact number, but I want to say it's less than 200 of those 827 boats or longline vessels left. So there's not a lot of longliners left in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, so I'm just saying, they, they're under the same rules that we are. They have to throw them back if they're less than 24 inches. No. no. So for red grouper, no, 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 no. Let's let's not get off the off the, the cart too much here. So red grouper is 20 inches for recreational fishermen, not 24. That's gags. Red grouper is 20 inches for recreational fishermen. For commercial fishermen, it's 18 inches. But before you get real, real upset, think about it like this. It pissed me off too. And I actually had a good conversation with a commercial fisherman after that Amendment 53 meeting. And I was like, hey man, it doesn't make any sense. If you catch an 18 inch red grouper and keep it, and I can't catch an 18 red grouper and keep 18 inch red grouper and keep it, I gotta throw it back. Because right now the fishery is rebounding. So we have a lot of these smaller red grouper. So we catch a lot of 18, 19 inch red grouper out there in deep water. And in deep water, they don't look so hot. I'd rather throw them in the box and keep them than try to throw them back to get that 20 incher. So I'm like, why does it make sense if you're allowed to fish next to me and keep an 18 inch red grouper? I was like, is there any way we can move that? Because the idea behind that, the reason behind that is to lower discard mortality. Because with the red grouper fishery for commercial fishermen, they're on an IFQ. They're on an individual based fishing quota. So they're allowed to catch, let's say, let's make a round number. You, you have an IFQ of hundred pounds. It does not matter if you bring in hundred pounds of 20 pound red grouper or you bring in 100 pounds of four pound red grouper, your quota is still the same. And before you're sitting there thinking, you're like, hey, hey, hey dummy, a four pound red grouper and 100 pounds, that's a lot of red grouper he's keeping compared to a 20 pound red grouper, he's only keeping five. Think about it like this, that 20 pound red grouper is more fecund. It produces more eggs. So keeping that 20 pound red grouper in the water and letting him take 25 pound red grouper instead of five 20 pound red grouper is actually better for the fishery, better for you in the long run. Because he takes more fish, but the fish he leaves in the water, those bigger ones, are more for come to producing more eggs. And would you, as a recreational angler, rather catch the 20 pound red grouper or the five pound red grouper? It's an interesting question, right? So that was his argument. I'm not saying I agree with it. I see some people shaking their heads and getting frustrated. I'm just saying that was their side of it. And the idea is when you are long lining, when you are vertical line fishing on a bandit rig and you pull up an 18 inch dead red grouper, yeah. might as well let them throw it in the box instead of throwing over a dead fish. So the, reg, the commercial fishermen are moving towards hoping and trying to plan for what's called a full retention fishery. So they want to be able to go out there and catch and keep whatever size fish that they land. Before you freak out, it's the same example I just gave, is if they catch a 14 inch dead red grouper, instead of throwing it back dead, they throw it in the box, it counts against their IFQ, and they still end their season or their trip once their quota gets filled. And their quota doesn't change, it's just they're catching smaller fish instead of larger fish. I don't make the rules. I'm just conveying the information. Don't shoot the messenger here, folks. Yes, Captain Vance. I still want to shoot somebody. It's so, easy to see why people go postal at those meetings. But when I went, 90% of the commission of the Gulf Council was commercial in December. Now he says we got over his amount of recreation. So, we got a half a chance. So Captain Vance Tice is 100% right. So it's basically 
I did a video five, six days ago. I was a little frustrated, maybe a little drunk. Uh, and Yay! I got on, yeah, exactly. That's how all good videos are made. Uh, so I got on Facebook and did about a 30 minute diatribe, a little bit of a diatribe, on how fisheries management works. State versus federal, federal versus NOAA fisheries. It's interesting. If you're interested in what we've been talking about, I highly recommend watching it. And take it with a grain of salt again. I was a little heated at the time, but any of our videos you can find on our Hubbard's Marina Facebook YouTube channel. YouTube channel keeps it a little bit easier because we've made a playlist called Federal Fisheries Management Issues. So you can go to that playlist and that's going to show you the handful of videos that I specifically made on these issues. Um, but you hit on a good point there about uh, basically where we're going with this whole deal and I think it goes back to what I was talking about before is we have a big issue with data. No one likes private recreational seasonal closures and these ACL closures, but that's the big misunderstanding is there's ACL closures, there's seasonal closures, and then there's closures because, hey, this fishery is not healthy, let's close it. Nothing, nothing recently has been closed because the fishery is unhealthy. Nothing. All the closures that have recently happened are because either the fishery is overcapitalized, there's a lot more people out there catching them than they thought because of that MRF FES change, or the fishery is super healthy and you're, and you're catching them too quickly. And so management has to catch up and slowly increase catch levels. So for Lane Snapper, for example, they increased the catch level over three times, almost four times as much because the fishery is healthy. Fishery is healthy and it takes time for management to catch up to that. Yes, that's what pissed me off and got me involved. And, and I was, uh, so people ask me a lot, they're like, do you feel like you make a difference? I personally, personally went to a council meeting furious that Lane Snapper had closed. I think they closed in like 2018 or 19, they closed for like 15 days at the very end of December when all the tourists are in town and we're the most busy. I was pissed. And they have a meeting in January. I came to that meeting, both barrels loaded, like angry. And I personally went to each council member because I had been going to the meetings. I knew who they were, what, who they represented. I knew the players. I knew how the system worked. I went to each one of them systematically by the time they got to refish committee they're like we'd like to vote to uh, increase the catch levels on lane snapper <laughs> went to full committee i worked all of them guys again and when it went to full council it passed unanimously and i was like sweet we're not gonna have a lane snapper closure and i told all my buddies we're not gonna have a lane snapper closure ever again i got the job done see ya we had a lane snapper closure <laughs> and that was because the feds, the NOAA fisheries dropped the ball. The council voted on it, finalized it, passed it in January of 2020. When in reality, it should have been April of 20, or they, they finalized it, passed it in January 2021. It should have been finalized and passed in April of 2020 because they initially voted on it January 2020. But we all know what happened after January 2020. The world went to hell in a handbasket and they didn't have a council meeting in April 2020. So they freaking forgot about Lane Snapper because of what I talked about earlier. Florida's badass and Florida has a lot of different fisheries. The other Gulf states don't care about Lane Snapper being one of them. So Lane Snapper got pushed down the docket and they didn't bring it back up until January 2021, a full year after their initial vote. They finalized it in January 2021 the feds didn't get the job done. They didn't make the rulemaking in time, and that's why Lane Snapper have closed. So, super frustrating. Watch the full five and a half minute video. You see some veins popping out the side of my neck. It's awesome. They're starting to come out right now, so we're moving on. Any other questions? Crabtree gone? Dr. Crabtree has retired. <laughs> did, did, coming in. Did, I'll, I'll tell a funny story. I was telling Vance this before, and uh, some of you guys might not like this story, but Dr. Crabtree is not that bad of a guy. Hate to, hate to break it to you. This is, uh, one, one person laughed. Thank you. Everybody's looking at me like, what is he talking about? 
Uh, so going to council meetings, again, Dr. Crabtree has the worst job ever in the fisheries management because he's the figurehead. He's the signature that closes the fishery. How would you like to have that job? Mm, hell no. I mean, there's literally stickers of dudes like peeing on Dr. Crabtree's name on bumper stickers. I've seen it. It's that, like, that's a crappy job to put you in that position, you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, did I say that? <laughs> so uh, so what, I, what I'm getting at is these people that we all, that, that generally become the villains, if you go and get involved and attend the meetings, they're really not villains. They're all people, just like you and I, and they all care about the fishery, but there's different rules and regulations and different stipulations that are working behind the scenes, like this Lane Snapper thing. It sucks. It's stupid. It makes no sense. But because of MSA, because of the way federal regulations work, because federal government takes a year to get stuff done, Lane Snapper closed, and it's really frustrating, and it's easy to say it's Dr. Crabtree's fault, he's in charge, he should have made the, the thing happen faster, and he didn't. And that's what's happened over the 18 years that he was regional administrator of NOAA, is he became a villain. But going to meetings, getting to know him, breaking down his defenses, because he is very defensive, understandably so, being threatened all the time when he goes to meetings. <laughs> He definitely has some defenses up, and over time I got to know him, and I, I remember one time he drinks dirty martinis, ironically. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. It's not that great, but <laughs> one time he got a little drunk after a council meeting, and I saw this side of him open up, and he was a good dude. He's, he is a good dude, and uh, he's, he is a fisherman, and he does care about the fish, and that's what he was there to do, but he's retired, so moving on. His replacement is Andy Strelchek. He is the new regional administrator of the Gulf of uh, NOAA Fisheries to replace Dr. Crabtree. It's Andy Strelchek. So Dr. Crabtree is gone, retired. Andy Strelchek has replaced him. Where's he from? Andy Strelchek is, I don't know. But he's also a good guy. And Andy was the assistant regional administrator for many, many years. And I got to know him at council meetings and he actually helped me move through because I talked about earlier how people have said, do you feel like you're uh, making a difference or you have an influence? I'll tell you a quick story. I was attending council meetings. Uh, I started actually through Vance Tice and, and his buddy Dennis O'Hearn attending, er, attending fisheries meetings at a very young age with my father, sitting in the corner and watching guys like Vance talk about these issues. And I was like, man, this is interesting. I kind of I kind of want to learn about this. And in 2016, I attended my first council meeting as what I would consider an adult. And, uh, and, and I remember getting there and getting really angry, getting super frustrated and like, these guys are out to steal my job. They don't know what they're talking about. This is BS. And I got on social media and started doing my, my, my diatribes about the same stuff. And I'll never forget, it was Captain Van Hubbard. Someone asked me about him earlier before the seminar started. Captain Van Hubbard, we got in an argument over social media and he was telling me that I was wrong and basically you need to get educated, son. And I was like, I, I don't know who you're calling son, but. <laughs> and he was right, he was right. He, he told me I need to get involved and I need to go to what's called the Marine Resource Education Program. And I was like, well, you're full of shit. <laughs> but he was right. And I, and I went and did it and I got involved in the Marine Resource Education Program. And now I'm the program principal of the Southeast region and I sit on the, national steering committee for the marine resource education program because that's what it's all about you got to get educated on how it works who the players are how to be efficient in the system and then you can be or you can go to fishing clubs like this one and show up and read the emails that this nice lady sends out and when she gets information she sends it out to the group so when information or meetings come up, you guys attend meetings and you right now sitting at this meeting are a part of fishery science and management because you showed up and you're interested and you give enough of a of crap to listen 
and try to get involved. So this is this is the first step. And then getting educated on the system is, is the next step. And then attending council meetings or FWC meetings or sitting on advisory panels, which are open. Everything about, that was one of the biggest things that I didn't know about getting involved was how do these stock assessments work? And who decides the health of this fishery? And how do they, how do they determine how many red snapper in the Gulf of, are in the Gulf of Mexico? They do stock assessments and those are open to the public. You can go there and sit at a data assessment workshop and tell this dude with four PhDs that he's full of shit. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I see something totally different on the water. And the other scientists are like, yeah, that guy's kind of crazy, but I believe him. And you can have that conversation. And it, it's a really transparent, open process. And if you approach it from a place of at least briefly educated like I was, and you approach it with somewhat of a, a delicate, somewhat political approach, you can really be effective. So as I was telling the story, I uh, attended the council meetings in 2016, really started going to every meeting in 2017. And my big thing was illegal charters. We have all, uh, in, in Madeira Beach, we had one guy who was literally saying, I don't have a captain's license, but I'll run a trip. Just tell them we're friends. You can't do that, that's illegal. So that was a big thing for me. We had that death in 2017, 18. Uh, the Jaguar in uh, Paso Grill, it was an illegal charter. Someone died on a charter boat. It made national news, and all you saw in national headlines was, someone dies on a charter in Florida. Like, oh, that's great for business and the industry. So illegal charters were a big issue for me uh, because I wanted to stem that issue and, and make sure people were running legally, insured, and making sure they were licensed to try to curb those national headlines about people dying when they come charter fishing in the state of Florida, which is not good for tourism in general. So I started beating the drum about illegal charters in federal waters and the head, the head of NOAA, Office of Law Enforcement, apparently didn't like it, but I was telling the council that he wasn't doing a good job. <laughs> so he came up to me after a meeting, he was like, you know, you're an illegal charter, right? <laughs> what? What are you talking about? In 1988, Refish Amendment 1 was enacted. After he told me this, I was like, this guy is, what, what? <laughs> I sheepishly went back to my hotel room and feverishly started a uh, in-depth dive. And what's cool about fisheries management is all that stuff is archived. 1988, Refish Amendment 1 happened. You can get the handwritten notes from that meeting on the Gulf Council website. And that's what I did. I started diving down and was like, this guy's full of shit, I'm gonna prove it. And, and uh, basically what happened was in 1988, they passed Reef Fish Amendment 1, which enabled a two day bag limit for overnight fishing trips. So our 39 hour trip, which you guys have done, you guys Yay! privately chartered it, yeah. And you you got a two day bag limit, it was bad, bad to the bone, right? You go out there, you're able to catch twice your daily limit because you're on a trip greater than 24 hours. It was awesome. And what we do is we fish sustainably. So we go out there and if red snapper season's open, we go out there and we'll target mangrove snapper through the night, during the day, we'll target red snapper, we'll catch our boat limit of red snapper, we'll move off them. But we'll catch our boat limit of red snapper sometimes in the first 24 hours of the trip. Long story short, 1988 Reef Fish Amendment 1 was passed and they mentioned in the handwritten notes in 1988, the boat that fishes out of Madeira Beach, the Florida Fisherman too. So in 1988, in the notes, they mentioned my grandfather's name and our vessel's name in the Refish Amendment 1. So they literally made the rule based around how we prosecuted the fishery. 1996, what happened? They did a consolidation of federal regulations. And they forgot some stuff. So in that consolidation, they made it illegal to, to possess more than a day's bag limit in the first 24 hours. 
So what they literally were telling me at this council meeting was, if you go out on a 39 hour trip, you have to throw back. You can catch two red snapper, but if you catch a third in the first 24 hours of the trip, throw that thing back. Let it float away dead, throw it back. Until the second 24 hours of the trip, then you can catch two more. What? Yeah. What? How does that help the fishery? When we're fishing efficiently and effectively and going out there and catching one fish and then moving to another species, catching that fish and then moving off them and catching another fish, or at least trying to, trying to fish effectively and promote healthy release and minimize discard mortality, that's what we're all about. And we work hard at it. And this guy's telling me I'm an illegal charter. It took me two meetings, two meetings took me two federal fisheries meetings to present a document, get it voted on, get it passed, and get it implemented into federal regulations. So when people tell me, do you think you're effective or do you think you can have a change or an effect on federal management, it took me two meetings to change federal laws. And that's how powerful you can be when you know the system, you know how it works, and you're educated on how the process can be implemented. And you know the players. And that's what's cool about our area, is look at Destin. Destin is the armpit of the world. Uh, Destin, <laughs> Destin has the Destin Charter Boat Association. They are the strongest single boat port in the entire Gulf of Mexico. There's like 200 and some off charter boats and party boats. They're in the Destin Charter Boat Association. It's led by my buddy Jim Green. And, uh, and they, they do a really great job at representing their industry and their port. From Panama City to, the Key, to Key West, from Panama City to Key West, there is not one, there is not one federal for hire or private recreational association. What? We represent 66% of Red Snapper 62%, somewhere between 62 and 66% of red snapper landings in the state of Florida. And most of them come from the peninsula, the West Peninsula coast of Florida. And there is not one private recreational association or federal for hire recreational association along this coast. I don't know. I don't know. I've, I've tried and kind of started a federal for hire association and now we're working towards, I sit on the board of the Florida Guides Association and we're working towards, um, I'm going to present it to the board at our next meeting is I want to build an offshore component of the Florida Guides Association, mostly to legitimize offshore fishing and make it easier for people to find offshore fishing charters and compete with the fishing bookers of the world, but also to solidify and unify our industry and our guests that might not own their own boat. Because what really frustrates me is sometimes people are like, the commercial fishermen, they, they're out there killing fish all year round. And the charter boats, they're able to kill fish longer and they've got bigger seasons. And I'm on my part, my private boat, and I'm not able to, to keep fish. And I literally had tell, someone tell me the other day, they're like, you make money off the fishery. You're a commercial fisherman. You guys should share the quota and we should have the majority of the fish. So I was like, wait a minute. And he said, he ended it with all citizens, should, or private citizens should have majority access to the, to the fishery. Everybody here is a citizen in the United States, right? Or, I mean, whatever. <laughs> we're, we're, all, we're all citizens, right? So we all have equal access, right? So to me, if you own your own boat, that doesn't change your access versus this guy or gal over here that doesn't own their own boat. Because this guy or gal who doesn't own their own boat, they're gonna go fishing with their friend or they're gonna hire a charter boat or party boat. They should have the same access as the guy over here who owns his own boat, right? Right? That person used to right there. <laughs> the skeleton guy? He used to have his own boat. Yeah, and then and then he saw the first service bill, and that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, and that's my thing, is we, we have to all 
figure out how to participate in and prosecute the fishery equally um, or not equally as much as it is fairly. And that's what's very, very, very tricky, and very difficult and very muddy because everybody wants the majority for themselves. We all got to come to the table realistically with better data, not data imputation and figure this thing out. I don't know how long I'm supposed to talk for, but I feel like Ray is standing up right now. <laughs> There's more questions, Ray. You're not taking this mic from me. What are we going to catch if we go out on your boat? Everything. Yeah. <laughs> How's the fishing right now out there? On, if we go out on your boat, what can we expect? So October 15th through November 5th, we have an extended red snapper season. So that's what we're going to be mainly targeting on our 12-hour stream and 39-hour trips. We've got a lot of room on our Sunday 12-hour or our Sunday 39-hour trips for red snapper. We've got a lot of room on our 12-hour stream trips for red snapper too. We just added five more through red snapper season extension. It's only three three weeks, October 15th through November 5th. So uh, we added five more trips to accommodate more guests. So that's mainly what we're going to be targeting. But mangrove snapper are biting well. We're seeing lane snapper, which close October 17th. Uh, yellowtail snapper. We're seeing the gag grouper bites going okay. We're seeing a lot of scamp grouper. Uh, the blackfin tuna bites going well. Near shore, we're seeing hogfish, black sea bass, and then obviously what I call a gray snapper. I heard someone earlier call it a grunt. It offends me. The white grunt or a gray snapper. We see a lot of those near shore and then porgies. That's a Hubbard snapper, whoever just mocked me. <laughs> check us out on Facebook. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, Pinterest. Follow us on all seven of the social medias. Find, follow us on the Sunday night show every Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. We do a Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube live stream show every Sunday night from 8.30 to 9.30. We give away over $700 in free trips, and we answer your questions live every Sunday night from 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. Every Saturday morning, we're live on the Real Animals radio show on News Radio 970 WFLA from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. And every Friday morning, we're live on Fox Channel 13 News around 8.15 a.m. to do a five-minute fishing report segment. So how you could support us is come out fishing with us, check out our website, watch our fishing reports. If you got your own boat and you're like, hey, bro, I'm never fishing with you, that's cool. That's cool. We have fishing weather reports. We have uh, under hubbardsmarina.com, go to fishing trips. We have the fishing weather links. We have fishing video links, which are how-to videos on how to tie, how to rig, how to bait, how to brine, all this good stuff, and fishing weather links. Because how frustrating is it, how frustrating, how frustrating is it when you go out on your own boat and you want to find a marine weather forecast? They don't have that stuff on the news regularly. On our website, all the marine weather links that I personally use to check the weather for my trips are right there on the website for you. Even if you're never going to fish with me, our website is a super useful tool. It is. Thank you. And we have the webcams and we have the uh, fishing federal fisheries information on our YouTube channel. We're also building out CaptainDillonHubbard.com, which is going to be completely surrounding the political atmosphere with fisheries management. So that's where I get to stay on my soapbox because it's my website. And if, you're busy, if you're too busy to go fishing, you're just too busy. Yeah. What's, what's up back there? Amberjack season is uh, open until the end of October 31st, and Amberjack season and Gag Grouper season, y'all enjoy it while it lasts. It's yeah, gonna be ugly. Where have they gone? They're gone. They're gone. I don't, I don't they're considered them. overfished and undergoing overfishing, and they're going to their Gag Grouper and Amberjack are undergoing both stock assessments right now. And they're both severely ugly. Amberjack seasons or Amberjack stock assessment has already concluded, 
and it, the results are ugly. And the council is going to start arguing over it shortly over what regulations are going to, I would assume we're going to see almost a complete closure of Amber Jack for the next couple of years. Yeah, and then, time, 130, yes, right. yeah, I agree. And then Amber, or uh, Gag grouper season, we're going to see right now it's a six month season. We're probably going to see almost a 40% reduction of bag uh, or access come uh, November, December, that stock assessment should be complete and we'll get the final stock assessment report. So sometime January, April, June of next year, the council will argue over it. So probably by the end of 2022, early 2023, the feds, because remember it takes them a freaking year to change anything, uh, that they'll finally institute a change in bag limits or management. So keep in mind, everything I'm saying about Amberjack and Gag Grouper will not happen until end of 2022, early 2023. But yeah, ugly on yep. Gags and Amberjack. Captain Ray, he's going to take this mic from me any second. What? Goliath Grouper, they per, they signed a proposed, this is FWC, this is not federal, so this is the state thing. They signed a proposed, a lot of news coverage got it wrong. They did not open or even okay a Goliath Grouper fishery. They voted on and approved a proposed draft of a Goliath Grouper fishery. So that will not go final until May at their next FW, or I don't know if it's their next, but it's the May FWC commission is when they vote on the final draft. And at the final draft is when they'll finalize how the tagging system works. In my personal opinion, I couldn't support it more. I really, really highly support a very limited, highly scientific collection. Meaning it, yeah, so I don't really necessarily support their size limit. But I really support, it should be an open-ended, you can kill any freaking size you want. It you should be, the tag. you should buy the tag and it should be more than 200. It needs to be about 200 along the west coast of Florida. Yeah, well that's the proposed is $500. It can change, it can fluctuate. They, they might make it as cheap as 100, they might make it as much as 1500. That's the proposal is 500. <laughs> And that's the proposal, the 24 to 36 inch. So in my, oh, that was my microphone. In my, in my opinion, they need to make it open-ended and they need to increase it a little bit. And it's, it must be mandatory. In my opinion, I'd like to see the tag be like 250, 300 bucks and it must be mandatory. If you win the tag and pay for the tag, you must drive that carcass to FWRI's lab in St. Pete. So that way they can do the agent growth composition data. They need the otolith out of the head. They need the fin ray samples. They need the stomach contents. They need the sexual age and sexual representation of the grouper. What? That means you can't sell the tag? I don't know how the system's gonna work. It's again, they approved a proposed draft. So what's on the website, everything you read is proposed not final and the final can change dramatically from the proposal it's called politics sir and it's fisheries so it's not as bad as that but again we're all american citizens sir doesn't matter what color or what political opinion. yes sir in the back there Badass. And it's virtual this year. So you Unfortunately. Know, you don't even have to put your underwear on. You can put your computer. Oh, my God. That's how Ray attended the radio show this weekend. They got a whole bunch of different things going on. Yeah. So FWRI is the Florida Wildlife Research Institute. It's a scientific branch of FWC. If you haven't been there yet, mark it on your calendars for next year because the marine quest is virtual this year which sucks it really needs to be in person because you get to tour the fwri lab the best part hands down in my opinion of the marine resource education program was walking through the fwri lab you get to meet the people 
who are behind the science and data collection that close and open your fisheries. And if you walk through there jaded like these idiots don't know what they're talking about, and you come out thinking the same thing, I'll give you $1,000. Because you will not. Those people care so much and they really do so much and it's so cool all the information that they're so passionate about it's it, it's really life-changing as far as fisheries science and management goes so i highly recommend signing up for marine quest 2022 but like ray said you can join this year and get an idea of how it works but it's virtual so it's not as cool as actually going there and walking through those labs and meeting the people behind the science and management. It'll be pretty cool. We do a supporters trip. Yes, we are. <laughs> after awesome. after this, we'll talk more about that. <laughs> yes, every Saturday morning from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. You can listen to the Real Animals radio show and also watch live on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, too. Appreciate everybody hanging out with me tonight. Thank you for listening. And uh, if you have more questions, you want to talk more, shoot me a message, shoot me an email. You can reach us right at hubbardsmarina.com. Look us up, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, TikTok, <laughs> Pinterest, all that other good stuff. And uh, also call us, call me. I do have a phone number. It is on our website. So hopefully we'll see you out in the docks. Thanks for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Good job. I love the fact that you brought all these rods and reels in for us to give away at the raffle tonight. Yeah. We didn't even, even talk about Obviously, fishing. we didn't talk about any of that.